there's a kind of beauty to the argument ex conveniencia, that St. Thomas is, is sounding the depths of the divine wisdom. And when he sounds the depths of the divine wisdom, he's asking about its coherence, he's asking about its integrity, he's asking about its splendor, its clarity, all the things that you mentioned at the beginning of your lecture. And in light of that evidence, right, he comes to discover within something that's, that's true and that's good, which is fascinating. Uh, and I hadn't thought about it in those terms, and maybe I'm just using this as a massive self-justification. Um, but there, go ahead. It's, it's yours. <laughs> hey, cheers. I'm always, I'm always looking for those until such time as they are. Yeah. Until they are, they're smashed before my very eyes. Um, so yeah, like in, in light of these facts, when, you know, like we are trying to, to formulate arguments when we're trying to get to the heart of the reality, um, how, you know, is there, is there a kind of discipline whereby we, you know, cling to the thing or whereby we chasten or whereby we um, kind of like reprimand that tendency to get lost in an aestheticism or to find ourselves drifting in the direction of the merely sensibly satisfying or however you might describe it. So I'm thinking about it in those terms, but yeah, you have a jumping off point there for, uh, yeah, different, yeah. different, different avenues. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, fascinating and and in a sense even the metaphors you're using for your friend you know he's a philosopher he likes to deal with reality he likes to be able to eat it he likes to be able to drink it he wants to you know get to grips with it um and i think that's in a sense revealing of a wider culture you know we live in quite a materialist um capitalist also culture where you want to possess things and and you want things to have an immediate um uh kind of purpose that you can touch and hold um and even if we think about the way that philosophy has gone and, and the way that certainly in uk universities it's narrowed um i think part of that reflects that broader culture and um, what i mean by that is um we're, we're not necessarily that comfortable with um, a more abstract contemplation um and, and similarly in theology, you can have an answer, well, let's not do the dogmatics and this thing, because we need to deal with social issues. Of course, social issues are really important. But there's there's also this part of in the human psyche, obviously, of, of, of the contemplative. Um, and um, I think beauty does have a role there. Um, but beauty does not mean falling into aestheticism necessarily, and nor does it mean becoming an aesthete. And I think that's where um, the recovery of beauty or the pre-modern understanding of beauty as always in relation to goodness and truth is so important. Um, uh, you know, Aquinas, is to, to, to come back to Aquinas, you know, he doesn't make beauty the, the primary structuring principle, but as I've just tentatively suggested, it, it's there in his work. Um, and not just, I mean, people can point to his liturgical poems and his uh, prayers where he, he's kind of engaging what we would think of as, as poetry, um, but also in the way that um, he writes his treatise, he gives thought to their order, to their harmony, to how everything fits together. Um, and we might say, well, wouldn't it be nice if um, some uh, philosophical textbooks, some of which seem to write in a way as to be intentionally obscure um, <laughs> and to be difficult to understand, like you just said, um, and, and that was my encounter with first encounter with Aquinas in undergraduate. I, I was studying all sort of phenomenological um, ideas, lots of continental philosophy, and I, I just suddenly came to uh, Aquinas because I was studying classical philosophy, and I felt this is so clear. This makes sense. He goes from A to B to C. I can follow his argument. Clarity. Clarity, as you say, is one of the three key conditions of beauty. So always in Aquinas, we have a model for someone where beauty is there, but it's in relation to goodness and truth. What happens, obviously, after, I mean, famously, it gets sort of, uh, you know, Kant gets the blame uh, with his critique of judgment um, and kind of separating off the aesthetic from the good and the true is you do get aestheticism, um, a, a kind of following of a, a kind of narrowed beauty, um, which is deliberately seen as an amoral sphere, as something not connected to the good or the true. 
Um, and, and I think, um, you know, in recovering beauty, we have to be careful there, not to sort of recover something as detached, but rather as something connected to the good and the true. And I do think that, you know, that's what von Balthasar was saying. He was saying that in the 20th century, you had a danger of moralism where uh, Catholicism was just a whole series of moral rules. And then you had a slight latent tendency within a certain kind of scholastic manualist tradition to present the truth as, as, as if it were just a series of things that you learnt, like a catechism. And what he says is we need to reintroduce beauty because the morality loses its taste, its flavour, its attractiveness without beauty. And similarly, truth loses its attraction without beauty. And, you know, I'm someone who loves Dante um, and Dante as a medievalist. How does he present the, the wise people? He presents them as philosoph philosophers, right? They're all lovers of wisdom. In his beautiful account, I mean, it's Bonaventure who gives the account of St. Dominic, but he calls him this lover of faith. And all the erotic language of the Song of Songs is there. Um, I think that is a, a wonderful thing to recover today, that sense that the quest for truth um, is um, an erotic one. It's, um, it's about being in love. It's about being attracted. And similarly, the, the good life. The moral life isn't some kind of Puritan moralistic or Victorian morals of just being good and doing what you ought to do. But instead, you can be in love with the good. It's something attractive. It's something which fulfills you. Um, and um, although we might not use the same gender, uh, gendered language as before, um, as I say, you know, this kind of allegorization of, of St. Dominic in love with um, Lady Faith or St. Francis in love with Lady Poverty. And again, that's that's like in love with the good. Um, uh, St. Dominic in love with the truth. Nonetheless, we need to recover that idea. Mm -hmm.